Now hear the word of the Lord from Mark 9, 2 through 10. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they only saw Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning, sojourn. Peace be with you. Uh, And Merry Christmas. Um, Welcome to our guests and visitors who are here. Uh, My name is Jonah. I'm one of the pastors here at Sojourn. Uh, Our mission as a church, what we're doing here is trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of who he is and what he has done for us. Uh, Build one another up as his church and send each other to follow him as instruments of truth, beauty, and goodness. So thank you all for being here. Uh, 11 years running, we have not lost a child or exposed him to open flame at a kid's choir. So thanks be to God. Uh, And thanks to all of the workers and the kids and the families um, for making it happen. It's a a beautiful day. Yeah, thank you. Um, And yeah, if you've been a part of our church for a while, have you noticed how the little kids are now big kids? it's kind of, it's sweet and bittersweet and beautiful. And uh, yeah, so it just feels like a day with a, a lot of grace and uh, grateful for the baptism we'll celebrate here in a few minutes too. Um, so next week is Christmas Eve and it's one of those strange times in the calendar where Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. And I know my logistical people out there are probably like, what are we doing? It's Christmas Eve, but it's Sunday. What do we do? We're going to worship Jesus. Amen. 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 Um, and so here's how we're going to do it. Uh, 9 and 11 a.m., we're going to have services that uh, our kids' discipleship classes won't be running that day. So all of our kids are going to be together here in the service. And it'll kind of be like a family-style service. Uh, little ones, you may or may not have a gift waiting for you. Deep in metaphor to encourage your young faith as the years go by. And then, so that's 9 a.m., 11 a.m., kind of a family style. Uh, probably be a shorter service. And then at 11 p.m., we're going to have our traditional candlelight Christmas Eve service, which has just become one of the sweet kind of hallmarks of the year for us. So 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 11 p.m. Good? Should I say it one more time? 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 11 p.m. 9 a.m., 11 a.m., family style, 11 p.m. candlelight. And we're going to give everybody a candle. Four and up. That's not an actual policy. We'll let the parents, we'll let the parents decide on that. Um, so, um, last week... We've been in the, if you're a guest with us, we've been traveling through the Gospel of Mark for some time now. And last week we hit the middle of Mark, both structurally, but also kind of theologically in terms of of the content. We got to the pivotal turning point in the Gospel of Mark. And now uh, last week and this week kind of allow us to finally answer the fundamental questions we've been asking since Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Who is Jesus and what is his mission? And maybe you've been feeling some of the suspense or things that have been left unsaid, or you've been feeling the tension of the gospel of Mark. And this morning, with clarity and power, we can answer the question, who is Jesus? According to Mark's gospel, as we will see and as we have seen, Jesus is God, Jesus is Savior, and Jesus is King. This moment on the Mount of Transfiguration is the moment that Mark has been building to, where Jesus is revealed as God, as Savior, and as King. Um, And if this is so, if Jesus is God and Savior and King, how are we to respond to him? Uh, During this Christmas season, there's oftentimes people come to church for the first time in a long time. Uh, Maybe grandma drug you to church or you're going to find yourself at a church and, and certain emotions rise up. You know, maybe take a second and consider, how do you feel at the idea of God coming near to you? If if God showed up in your world, what might his face look like as he's looking at you? Uh, How does that immediately feel to you, thinking about God coming near to you? And if he came near to you, how would you respond? 
How are we to, we to respond on a day like was just described to us from Mark chapter 9, a day that is ordinary, but it suddenly becomes miraculous? Have you ever had a day like that before? Uh, maybe the birth of a child. Maybe something happens, and a day you thought was normal suddenly turns spectacular. How are we to respond when our eyes are opened like the blind man from a few weeks ago, and we see Jesus? These verses of chapter 9 at the heart of Mark's gospel reveal to us the heart of God. They show us who Jesus is, and they teach us how to respond when he comes near. Verse 2 begins, Six days later... Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. Six days is important. Six days ago, if you were here with us last Sunday, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say a prophet. And then six days ago, he, he looked to his disciples and said, but who do you say that I am? Six days ago, Jesus and his disciples entered this region of Caesarea Philippi, as we said last week, a dark place, uh, an evil place, the kind of place that made people's blood run cold, uh, a place that Jews believed on the top of this high mountain lived the Canaanite god Baal. The bad guy lives on this mountain they're about to climb. Uh, Romans called this place the Rock of the Gods, believing it was the home of their gods, filled with sites of all kinds of pagan worship. The Mesopotamians called this actual place the Gates of Hell, uh, because they believed it to be the site of spiritual invasion on earth and a literal gateway to the underworld. At this place, six days ago, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Six days ago, Peter said, the Messiah... And then six days ago, Jesus said, I must suffer and be killed. Six days is not a day that sticks out in the scriptures very much. It's an incomplete day because a six days leaves you itching for a seventh. Um, it, it's an unresolved note waiting for completion. The sixth day of creation longs for the seventh day of rest and completion. Uh, if you're a Bible reader, maybe six days makes you think of Exodus 24, where Moses climbed up a high mountain to meet with God, and for six days he waited for God to show up. So like Moses, after six days, Jesus and the disciples climb up a mountain. They enter the literal gates of hell. They climb the rock of the gods and the disciples had to expect that something significant was about to happen. There's really only one reason people in the Bible go up a mountain. And that's to receive revelation from God. Or if you're lucky, receive the presence of God himself. Moses climbed up a mountain to meet with God and receive revelation from God. He received the beginning of the law. The Ten Commandments. God's guardrails for how his chosen people are to live. Elijah went up a mountain to meet with God. Elijah, the one who promised God's salvation, would come. So perhaps the disciples thought that like Moses and Elijah, they were going up the mountain to meet with God. But as they go up, something we don't have the imaginations for, something truly incredible, unexpected, breathtaking, astounding happens. As the men watched, verse 2 continues, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make. They go up the mountain, they don't get a cloud like Moses received. They don't get a still, small voice like Elijah received. Instead, they see Jesus himself transfigured into dazzling, bright white. They see Jesus revealed in glory. Jesus as he is. And then verse 4. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Think very carefully about this with me. Jesus does not go and talk to Elijah and Moses. Moses and Elijah go and talk to Jesus. I don't know who it would take to walk into this room right now that would make your heart beat fast and you suddenly get nervous. I don't know what celebrity you would be most intimidated by. 
Moses and Elijah are about as big of a deal as it could get in the Jewish world at the time. There would be no bigger celebrity that could walk in than Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah are coming to talk with Jesus. These pillars of the Old Testament, Moses representing the law of God, Elijah representing the promised salvation of God, come to meet with Jesus. We cannot overstate how significant this is. Jewish people believe that in the day of God's salvation, in the time of fulfillment, that somebody like Moses would come. Moses said a prophet would come after me in Exodus chapter 18. And so Jews were expecting that somebody like Moses would come. Jews at that time believed that when God's great salvation was upon them, one like Elijah would come. And now at the top of this mountain, Moses and Elijah come to one like Moses and Elijah, whose name is Jesus. The law is fulfilled in Jesus. All the Old Testament regulations were pointing to Jesus. And now they find their fulfillment in Jesus as Moses comes and talks to Jesus. When you read in the Bible about Moses going up a mountain to talk to God, you have to read that as Moses going up a mountain to talk to Jesus. When you read about Elijah going up a mountain to hear from God, you must read Elijah going up the mountain to hear from Jesus. What is Mark showing us in this? Salvation is fulfilled in Jesus. All the Old Testament promises of God's great rescue find their fulfillment in Jesus. Here at the Mount of Transfiguration, the purpose of God's law and the promise of God's salvation are found together in Jesus. With the three disciples here, after what we've gone through previously in Mark, we see the mission of Jesus is revealed. The mission of God finds a home in Jesus too. This scene, seven or eight verses, summarize the whole Bible, reveals the heart of God, the plan of God, the mission of God, the promises of God. Consider again the geography here. The rock of the gods, the gates of hell. Jesus calls this place the gates of hell in the gospel of Matthew. Here at this place of spiritual oppression and evil, Jesus reveals himself as he truly is, defying the spiritual forces of evil. If there is anywhere that Jesus could reveal himself in his supernatural glory, why choose this place? That's the place that everyone thought evil reigned and evil was in charge. So here at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is revealing himself in his fullness. I am the king of heaven and the king of earth. He's asserting all authority over the seen and unseen realms. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is revealed as the fulfiller of God's law. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is revealed as the savior of the world. It's all here. This is the Christ. And still, the disciples do not understand. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He said this, listen, because he didn't really know what else to say. They were all terrified. This is, again, you can't overestimate how shocking it would be for Moses and Elijah to suddenly show up here. And Peter is freaking out. This is a moment worth remembering. This is a moment worthy of a memorial. And he's just kind of, you know what happens when you get scared and nervous. You say stuff without really thinking about it. You just start throwing ideas out there. And that's what Peter does. He's terrified and he's confused. And in his terror and confusion, he shows how little he understands. If he understood the gravity of this moment and what was being revealed about Jesus, he would not have offered to build three tents he would have fallen to his knees and suggested they build one throne. One throne for King Jesus. One throne for the Lord of the law, the one in whom all of God's commands are satisfied and obeyed. 
one throne for the savior of the world, the one through whom God's promised salvation has come, one throne for the king of kings who has all authority in heaven and on earth over rulers and authorities in the seen and unseen realm. If he understood the moment, he would have said, let's build one throne. They went up a mountain expecting to receive revelation from God. And what they received was the revelation of Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is what Mark told us from the very beginning. Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And here in Mark chapter 9, we see what it means. The law and God's promises come to worship King Jesus. And then, this incredible, profound moment, then, after the law and the promises are fulfilled, then, after Jesus is revealed in his glory, then comes the cloud of the presence of God. Verse 7, then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. It's incredible. A few minutes ago when I asked you, what comes about in you when you think about God coming near to you? What emotions are stirred? How would you expect God to act if he came near to you? Is this the kind of thing you would expect God to say? He, he doesn't say, wish you guys were doing a little bit better. I see you guys are kind of lazy. You haven't read your Bible in a couple of weeks. What does he say? He points to Jesus and says, this is my boy. I love him so much. Therefore, what? Just listen to him. How do you respond when God comes near? Listen to him. How are you to respond when an ordinary day is revealed to be miraculous? Listen to Jesus. This is the heart of God. What is God's will for my life? It's so simple and beautiful. Listen to his son, Jesus. And then, just as suddenly, the cloud is gone, Moses and Elijah disappear, and only Jesus remains. Only Jesus remains. What is Mark showing us? The law has passed away, thanks be to God. The time of promise making has given way to the time of promise fulfilling. Thanks be to God. Look to Jesus and listen to Jesus. It is a stunning summary of the entire Bible. It reveals the heart of the good news. And, you know, if you've been coming to our church for a period of time, you may have noticed that I'm kind of application averse. Um, some of that is because most of us are kind of spiritual addicts where we come in wanting to know what are the things that we can do to make God happy with me. Just tell me what to do. Uh, if, you, if you sat through some of my sermons at some point, you've probably left wondering, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, I also kind of like watching everybody squirm under the discomfort of you're just loved. Well, I can't be just loved. I said this last week. I shouldn't say illustrations two weeks in a row, but when someone invites you over to dinner and you say, what can I bring? What's the worst thing they can say back to you? <laughs> Nothing. But then... You just want me to come over just because you like me? I'll bring something. I'll get cheese. I'll go to Sam's Club and get a fruit plate. Like we freak out under the impossible weight of being loved. Uh, so I don't, I don't like giving you guys things to do. I don't like feeding the addicts. Um, but there is an application today that is so simple but profound and earth shattering. What do we do when God comes near? What is the great application of this? Listen to Jesus. And all of your doing, your busy life, your productive spirituality. You guys know what I mean by productive spirituality? If you don't know what I mean, try to stop reading the Bible for three days and watch how you freak out. Uh, or go try to do nothing for a whole day as a spiritual act of devotion to God. We cannot do it. If we are not doing, achieving, being productive in our spirituality, surely God is angry with me. In all of your busy life, in all of your doing, in all of your productive spirituality, how are you making time to listen to Jesus? Um, and 
I've been talking about this like both with individuals and as a church for a while now. And when I say something like that, people typically respond with, what do you mean? Well, let me show you how to listen to Jesus. This is what you do if you want to take notes or if you just, you can memorize it. It's not too terribly difficult. Um, you get somewhere quiet and then you pray either out loud or silently, something along the lines of speak to me. Um, I like using the words of the prophet Samuel who says, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Isn't that interesting? Speak, Lord. Well, then what do I do? Then you get as quiet as you can for as long as you can. And for some of you, that might be 30 seconds. And then you're, you're thinking about how you, you broke your toe on a slip and slide when you were seven, and then how much you like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and you really want to try the new peppermint frosty from Wendy's. You know what I'm saying? Your mind starts jumping all over the place. What do you do when that happens? Well, you just say something like, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then you do it for 30 seconds. Maybe, maybe you go crazy and you do it for five minutes. Uh, maybe after a period of time, you'll go to one of those weird Catholic places like St. Meinrad's and try to be quiet with people who are quiet for days on end. And you'll say something like, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Too many of us, I've heard it so much over the years, will say things like, well, but God doesn't talk to me. Jesus doesn't talk to me, pastor. He talks to you as you're a pastor. Of course, he talks to you, but he doesn't talk to me. Um, you know, think about if somebody did all of the talking in a relationship with you for 25 years. How might that affect the relationship? A lot of us feel like Jesus doesn't talk to us. And I don't mean this as any kind of criticism or judgment. But I think a big reason we feel like Jesus isn't talking to us is because we are not listening to Jesus. How do you listen to Jesus? This is not overcomplicated. You listen to Jesus just like you listen to anybody else. You ask a question and then you be quiet and you listen. You can say things like, speak to me. Or what would you have me do? And then listen. These are great questions to ask. You can ask him in the car. You can ask him in the shower. You can ask him raking leaves. You can ask him wrapping Christmas presents or baling hay or milking goats or whatever it is you do. You don't have to be somewhere spiritual or holy to ask these kinds of questions. You just got to ask him and, and make space for it. Um, now, I'm guessing some of you are saying, boy, that sounds weird and mystical. And I would say it's weird and mystical. Like it doesn't just sound that way, it is that way. It is weird and, and it is mystical. We're talking about communing with the God of the universe, the maker and creator and sustainer of all that is. And maybe you're just like, I'm just not ready for that kind of silence. And I understand. Um, you have beautiful words of Jesus to listen to in the Bible if you're not ready to just listen. You can just go to the gospels and, and look for all of the invitations of Jesus. What are the things that he says to people like you and people like me? Um, now I was thinking about this last week, and I'm just going to share three invitations that Jesus made to people. And these are not cherry-picked. These are three of the most normal things Jesus says to people in his life and ministry. Mark chapter 9, which we'll see soon. Woo. Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I won't give you more to do. I won't give you more to feel bad about. I won't give you something to prove. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Listening to Jesus means coming to him to find rest. If the law is fulfilled in Jesus, that means the law is fulfilled for you. So find rest from your performance. Find rest from your obedience. And come to Jesus and find rest. In John chapter 7, they're coming to the end of a big feast and a festival. On the last day, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. 
Coming to Jesus is like drinking deep of clear, pure water that satisfies. Did you notice he shouted it over the crowds? He didn't pass out flyers for an entrance exam. He didn't pass out assessments to see who was worthy and who was not worthy. He shouts over a crowd, this water is for everyone. If the law is fulfilled and the promise stands, everyone may come. So are you weary? Are you thirsty? Listen to Jesus by coming to Jesus for satisfaction. Trust him. Listen to him. Drink from him. This means the aim of your life becomes encountering the presence of Jesus so that your thirst might be quenched. Come to him and find rest. Drink from him and be satisfied. One last one. We could do this all day and I'd have fun with it, but I'm going to give you one more. After the resurrection of Jesus, did you notice the disciples even afterwards? Now Jesus said, don't tell anybody what you just saw on the mountain until after I rose from the dead. Remember, do you remember when he said that? Don't tell anybody about this. And then the disciples are like, what does he mean rise from the dead? <laughs> like rise from the dead is what he meant. I just think that's funny. After the resurrection, after Peter's betrayal, we remember what Peter did, right? He denied he knew Jesus three times. Do you all know the first words the resurrected Jesus has for Peter, his betrayer? John 21, come and have some breakfast. How can you say this? Because the law is fulfilled and the promise is kept. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, which means he freely forgives Offering full pardon and warm welcome. What does that look like? It looks like offering the one that betrayed you breakfast. Of all of the things you might anticipate God to say to the one who turned from him and betrayed him in such a heartbreaking manner. Is come and have breakfast? Was that anywhere on your list of expectations? Come and have a feast with me, Peter. Feast upon me, Peter. Find rest, Peter. Drink. Listen to me. We could have we gone to John chapter 1 where Jesus invites us to come and see. We could have gone to Mark chapter 6 where he invites us to find rest. We could have gone to Matthew 25 where he invites us to receive the kingdom. Or the many places where Jesus says, follow me. The point of the transfiguration is simply this. The saving activity of God is found exclusively in Jesus Christ who is the Son of God, the Messiah. What does that mean? It means that we find true rest in Jesus. It means we find true food in Jesus. Where do we find peace with God and each other? Jesus. Where do we find victory over spiritual darkness and oppression? Jesus. That's why all of the imagery, all of the invitations are saying essentially the same thing. Did you hear it? No matter which invitation you look at, no matter which gospel you go to, the invitations are fundamentally the same thing. Come to me. Jesus says, come to me, follow me, listen to me. So how do we respond when God comes near? We come to Jesus, follow Jesus, listen to Jesus, however you would prefer to hear it, because Jesus is God, Jesus is Savior, and Jesus is King. So come to Jesus, follow Jesus, and listen to Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're willing and able, stand with me, and we'll pray and celebrate a baptism.